All right, uh, thanks everybody for sticking around. My name is Kurt Thomas, and today I'm going to be talking about ad injection, and in specific, the software developers and network operators that are tampering with the user's browsing experience to monetize them against their consent. And this is joint work with Berkeley and a number of other institutions that are all integral to making this study happen. So the word that's gotten us to this point today is that browsers are in many terms now analogous to the operating system. Uh, you access your Facebook, your Gmail, any cloud stored data, and even sensitive resources. This is all mediated by our browser. This has given rise to this new type of threat that we call web injection, specifically where you have malware or unwanted software that tampers directly with the web browsing experience uh, to make money either off of user interactions or the sensitive contacts it has access to, like cookies or sessions. Uh, one of the areas in this space is something we call ad injection. So if you have one of these ad injectors installed, this is what it looks like when you go to Amazon.com. All of a sudden you have all these new ads on the top of the screen, the right hand of the screen, the bottom of the screen. And many of these are legitimate like brands that are being advertised. And if you click on this, you'll go and find a real product. Uh, but some of them are also deceptive in practice as well. Like the ad in the very center of the screen that's saying there's some new download that you should have. Uh, this is actually a scareware campaign that's uh, being injected into the content. Uh, this really leads to a crummy user experience in Chrome, and we're seeing that from receiving over 100,000 complaints from users over the last year with respect to this ad injection ecosystem. And this is the top Chrome complaint that we receive of basically all time. And there's a very consistent theme amongst the users that come forward to us and say what's going on with their browser. Uh, the first thing is that there's no consent as to how the software was installed on the machine in the first place. Uh, the second is that they often misattribute ads to being the fault of the page owner uh, rather than the software they have installed. So if you go to Wikipedia and all of a sudden you suddenly see all these new advertisements, uh, you think, why is Wikipedia doing this, not what do I have on my machine? And the last thing is that there's no clear path to removal. Even when uninstall options are bundled inside of these software, they often make you go through some sort of survey or some other roundabout mechanism of getting uninstalled uh, that's incredibly confusing to users. So what we wanted to do with our study is actually explore holistically what this ad injection ecosystem looks like. Who are all the players involved? And specifically what I'll talk about today is uh, what the prevalence of ad injection is, the number of users that have this installed on their machine, uh, as well as the delivery mechanism that got them to this point, be it an extension, a binary, or even an ISP. And the last thing we'll look at is who are the advertisers and ad networks that are actually either complicit in this or negatively impacted by this as well. And while Sunshine is a great purpose to our study, really what we want to ultimately identify are bottlenecks in this entire ad ecosystem chain um, that are tied to this deceptive ad revenue that could potentially be disrupted by actions within the security community or within the advertisement community. So the first thing we wanted to do is understand how many users are actually affected by ad injection in the wild. And the way we did this is noting that Google is often one of the primary targets for this type of behavior. So if you go to Google.com and you search for an iPhone, all of a sudden you're going to see all these new advertisements that are appearing. And they look like Google advertisements, but they're in fact uh, deceptive and not original to the page. And so that's all highlighted in red. Similarly, if you go to YouTube and you search for Taylor Swift, maybe you're a Swift and security fan, uh, all of a sudden you see this new browser toolbar that says you, know, you can download videos, which is in fact leading to malware. So kind of the key insight that we had is that because we, as a server side, know which content we're going to serve to users, we can construct a whitelist of all the scripts, the iframes, and the URLs that should appear on that page, and actually distribute this whitelist to the client. Uh, and then when the client actually loads their property uh, and you know, everything is rendered, all of these DOM elements are being inserted into the Google origin, and so we can actually scan the origin for non-whitelisted content uh, and report back things that are violating this whitelist. So if you're familiar with like, content security policies with browsers, this is very similar. Uh, but we opt for a slightly different mechanism. Uh, what we do is, for a random sample of pages between June of last year and September of this year, uh, we embedded inside page this kind of integrity JavaScript function that uh, for each page we served, we also knew all the content that should appear on that page. Uh, and then we sent that to the user. And then after like, a short delay of like five to 10 seconds, after any ad injector should be tampering with the page, uh, we'd go and check all the, uh, the quality of the content. One thing to note is we're operating in a hostile environment here. We don't know whether it's the operating system, an extension, or an ISP that's actually doing all these page changes. All we know is that somewhere between us sending the content to the client and them rendering it, something tampered with the page. Um, and they can also potentially tamper with our measurement, which isn't something we contend with in the study, and it's like an acknowledged limitation. Uh, nevertheless, we're able to collect like 102 million samples throughout this period of potential pages that could have ad injection in them. 
So one thing to note is just because you have new content inside your Google DOM doesn't necessarily mean it's advertisement content. There could be legitimate browsing extensions or any other number of applications that modify the browser to the benefit of the user. Uh, so one of the key insights we had is that for all of these tampered pages that we were having reported back to us, 89% of them included some form of rogue JavaScript inserted into the page. Uh, there were about 19,000 distinct scripts that we found, but they follow like a zip-like distribution. So the top 100 scripts account for like 74% of all tampered pages. So we can just concentrate all our effort in this head of the distribution and leave the tail uh, to maybe future work. Um, but once we look down, it's like, okay, you have this foreign scripts that are all being injected into Google's content. What do they do? What we did was we manually investigated all of them and reverse engineered what was going on. We found that 65 of those top 100 scripts uh, that are appearing all over the place are actually related to ad injection. And the others were like jQuery or maybe some security toolbars that users had installed. And we omit those from the study and we only focus on these scripts that are related to ad injection. So what we found is that uh, based on this distribution, 5% uh, of all clients visiting Google have some sort of ad injector installed on the machine. And this translates to roughly tens of millions of users on the web. If we look at who are the providers of these scripts, we see that superfish.com is one of the most notorious, uh, affecting 3.9% uh, of Google's users. Superfish made a big splash recently because of uh, the Lenovo incident of them basically bundling into uh, laptops pre-installed. Uh, but we also see a number of other ad injectors in this space. Uh, Jolly Wallet is the second most popular. Jolly Wallet doesn't actually do ad injection, it does affiliate fraud. So when you go and buy a product on Walmart or Amazon, they will modify the cookies at checkout time such that they get a kickback from that purchase. Uh, and so there's a number of different behaviors that we're seeing related to this kind of web monetization mechanism. Uh, ad injection is a global problem. In the US, it affects about 2.6% of users, and it's more concentrated in uh, South America as well as the uh, Asia Pacific region. One thing to note, though, is what we're finding is that it's very much a browser problem and not an operating system issue. So 5.5% of Windows users have an ad injector installed, but we also see this affecting Mac users, which really is because now that we have this browser that is analogous to an operating system, you only need to write software that affects Chrome or Firefox and IE. You don't have to worry about the underlying platform, and that's what gives rise to this kind of global distribution. So now that we know who the players are, these scripts that are being injected into user content, the question is how did it get there in the first place? What are the distribution techniques that these ad injectors are using to affect users? Uh, it turns out that this is the, the page for Superfish, um, that it's an affiliate model. So all of the top ad injection scripts do this model where they say, okay, you have a browser extension or some popular software that users are already installing. We'll help you monetize that. We'll give you a drop-in JavaScript library. They say it's plug and play. We support multiple languages and everything else. All you have to do is get this inside the user's browser. It doesn't matter how you do it, and then we'll reward you for that. So specifically what this ad affiliate model does is uh, people like Superfish and Jolly Wallet will provide you an injection library, and this manages all the advertisement selection based on the page that you're viewing, as well as manages all the advertisement relationships. And then the affiliates are in charge of just distributing the binaries or extensions in any way possible. This can be via like bundling, it can be via social engineering, or even as we'll show a bit of malware distribution as well. And affiliates in turn get paid for clicks or on some sort of commission basis. So if we look at uh, our client traffic, we can actually pull out all these affiliate IDs that are appearing in the ads that are being injected. And so for Superfish, we see there are around 500 different affiliates that are participating in this program. And the top affiliate is this uh, extension development platform called Crossrider. And they control like 44% of all of Superfish's market share. And we see a very consistent picture with all of these other ad injection libraries. We have on the order of like a thousand different affiliates, uh, and many of them are popular browser toolbars like Shopper Pro, iWebBar, and others. Um, given that we know this affiliate model, what we wanted to do was understand where are these extensions and binaries coming from, and what's the distribution amongst them. Uh, so we have access to Google Safe Browsing data, which is about 25 million binaries uh, collected from around the web over the last year, as well as we have 1 million extensions from WebEval, which is uh, Chrome's internal mechanism for studying extensions, as well as Hulk by Alexandros Capravelos uh, for analyzing malicious extensions. So our approach is to basically say, okay, we have all of this binaries and extensions. We don't necessarily know what they are. Let's go look for those network characteristics that we also saw being indicative of ad injection, as well as these affiliate IDs. 
So we found about 50,000 binary or 50,000 extensions and 34,000 binaries that were all injecting advertisements in this data set. If we look at who these binaries and extensions are participating with, we see again that Superfish is a top program, uh, controlling about 50,000 extensions and 33,000 binaries, uh, and it dates back to September of 2012. Um, we also see a bunch of other ad injection uh, platforms all using extensions and binaries, and if you look at this, it doesn't add up at the bottom, and that's because people have four to five extensions, and, or a single extension will contact four to five different ad injection libraries at once trying to maximize the profit they can get out of a single user. Uh, there's really no loyalty to the affiliate program that they're participating in. They're just trying to make as much money as possible. We also note that uh, in the client traffic logs that we have, we see about 35% more injected ads in HTTP versus HTTPS traffic, which means that there is the possibility that people in the network are doing this as well, be it hotels or maybe even ISPs. Given that we have this giant affiliate model, uh, there's this contention of minimal control over who joins these affiliate networks. And this relates to then malware joining this ecosystem. So 17% of all the binaries we identified doing ad injection were also flagged for some other form of malicious behavior. And this is true for 38% of extensions as well. And the other things they were doing were like search hijacking, uh, Facebook section hijacking to basically spread uh, like a social contagion within Facebook and user tracking. So once again, all these other web injection monetization techniques are being bundled with ad injection. So the last thing we wanted to look at were who are the ad networks and the advertisers that were actually responsible for um, one supplying these advertisements as well as who's negatively impacted by this. So the approach we took is that we have all of these extensions that we know are doing ad injection, and we happen to know which pages they're injecting ads on. About 75% uh, of all the Alexa top 100 have ads injected into them. So what we do is we took this isolated environment, we launched one of these ad injection extensions, and we'd navigate to Google and Amazon and Walmart, and using the same integrity check function we had for Google, we apply it to all these other domains and identify the ads that are being inserted into these pages, and then go ahead and click on them. So we're able to collect like a data set of about uh, 100,000 clicks, and it looks something like this. So when you go to google.com and you search for, say, Android, uh, the Superfish logic that's injected into the page will make a post request out to their server and say, hey, I have this page, and they'll return back an advertisement saying, we have an offer from Best Buy, $40, inject this into the page. We go and click on that new advertisement, and you go through this complex redirect chain through Superfish, Window Shopper, Price Grabber, before ultimately you land up on Best Buy. And there's really no loyalty here. As soon as you land on Best Buy, all of a sudden that page gets laden with a bunch of advertisements as well. So there's really a negative uh, experience for the advertisers that are being affected by this too. What we found is that from all of these click chains that we enumerated, there were three ad networks that were supplying 77% of all the advertisements. And these are deal time, price grabber, and biz rate. Uh, these three advertisers would then fan out to a larger set of ad networks and then from there a larger set of ad networks until you reach about 3,000 advertisers that are being affected just in our small sample set. These are major brands like eBay, Sears, and Walmart, uh, a lot on the shopping side of things, but we also see a number of other players being affected as well. So if we take a step back now, we can like, have this very nice holistic image of this funnel of ad injection. Uh, at the very top, we see there are tens of millions of users that have this type of software installed on their machines. There's about 100,000 binaries and extensions that we know of that are doing this type of behavior that are causing it. Uh, there are about 1,000 affiliates who are the controllers of this software that are getting it installed on users' machines. And then 25 affiliate programs like Superfish and Jolly Wallet that are controlling all the advertisement selection. And ultimately, only three advertising networks that are responsible for supplying the majority of all these ads. So, Kind of wrapping up today, you know, we have this study. Uh, we also wanted to take action against ad injection, not just have this holistic image. Um, so some of the immediate actions we took is based on uh, the Chrome Web Store. We found 192 extensions that were still active that affected 14 million users with ad injection. Uh, these were all now pulled from the Web Store for deceptive practices that violated Google's policies. Uh, independent of this study, Google now provides a militia, or an unwanted software removal tool called Chrome Foil. Uh, that will help with ad injection as well as a lot of these other web injection monetization techniques. And then lastly, we reached out to all the advertisers and the ad networks that were being adversely affected by this. You know, many of the advertisers don't even know that they're sourcing traffic from ad injectors. They only know that they have a relationship with a relatively high quality ad network who then syndicates out to other networks, ad networks and on and on until you finally reach the ad injector. So there's really no accountability in the ad chain uh, that allows this type of behavior to happen. 
And while we can take a whack-a-mole approach to trying to solve ad injection, where we like block extensions and block binaries, ultimately you need ad networks to disincentivize this practice altogether. If there's no ads to inject into the page because nobody's willing to deal with these type of software developers, the whole practice falls apart. And that's where we think we can have the most impact with this type of uh, study. Uh, so with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, uh, Joe from RSA Lab. Uh, I got a question about uh, the data set. I wonder if you're able to collect the data, uh, um, I mean, users' traffic from China, because I know Google is blocked by China. And uh, from my experience, it's like AdWare is also a big problem in China. So I want to see if I have any comments or discussion on that. Yeah, so if you notice our geographic map, you'll see that China has no data. Uh, there's a couple other regions where the sample size was too slow or small as well. Um, we do think this biases our data set, but also just collecting from Google's perspective is also a bias in itself. You know, ad injectors, based on doing some reverse engineering of them, some of them explicitly blacklist Google properties and won't tamper with them, but will tamper with other pages. So we have only a small perspective of all the ad injection space. Thank you. Okay, more, more questions, yeah. Uh, very nice talk, uh, gone from UC Santa Barbara. So uh, this might be a little detailed. Uh, in your slides, you show a power, a power law distribution showing that a small number of scripts contributed to most of the injection events. Uh, I was wondering whether you actually did some analysis on the tails and whether are there differences between those scripts versus the top uh, Yeah, we didn't have time necessarily to do this. Um, we can say that if you include the tail in all of that injection, it would increase the levels by at most 3%. Um, some of them look like randomly generated scripts, but I think a lot of them are also probably smaller extension developers. Um, but it is worth looking into the tail. We just concentrated only on the most extreme cases where we thought we could have the most impact. Thank you. Okay, one more question here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Ekin Akush, Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. Uh, I was just wondering about the advertisements that were injected into these pages. Did you notice any behavioral advertisings? Because if these extensions essentially run in the browser, they have lots of data about what the user does and whether they were utilizing that data to sort of serve better advertisements and therefore get better click rates. Um, most of the advertisements that we saw basically only pulled down the page topic. So we looked at what parts of the content were uh, sent in the post request to all these ad injection servers. Uh, and the majority is just what is, did you search for? And sometimes what are the other images that are on the page? And that's how they do advertisement targeting. Uh, we do see some instances where people will actually leak entire, like they'll add tracking pixels to every page a user visits and leak all of that to other servers. Uh, but we consider that to be a different attack from ad injection. We think that's user tracking or uh, pixel insertion attacks. Okay, 